with us once more and again for the reading of the word of Almighty God. Let me direct your attention to the book of Daniel chapter 3. Verses 28 and 29. Book of Daniel chapter 3. <coughs> verses 28 and 29. And I would ask that you would read both of these verses aloud with me, please. The Bible says, together with me, please. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him, and have changed the king's word, and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree Every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made a dunghill, because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. Amen. And certainly may God bless the reading. and the healing of his holy and his divine will. Bow forward of prayer please. Our Father, our God, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy great and glorious name. We're thankful, Heavenly Father, this day for the blessedness of this occasion of which we have been gathered together that we might worship, praise, and exalt your name. We have come into this house that we may magnify you, Father, and give glory and honor unto you. Heavenly Father, we have come at this portion of worship that we might receive a word from thee, something that will help us in the days ahead something that will strengthen our weary spirits and cause us to run on a little while longer. Bless me as thy messenger, Father, that I will open my mouth and speak according to the oracles of thy word, neither adding to nor taking away from, but rightly dividing thy holy and divine word. Bless the hearts of every hearer, Father, They'll be open and receptive to what thou hast to say this day from thy word. Lord God, speak unto us from thy word, and thy children will hear what thou hast to say. Yes, Lord. We give you thanks this day, in thy son Jesus' name, amen. amen. As we look at this passage here in Daniel chapter 3, we want to speak to you from the subject, our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. The word awesome expresses an emotion that is characterized by reverential fear, wonder, and amazement. It's literally an emotion that combines dread and a great respect for someone's unusual and outstanding ability. The word awesome in its context has been appropriately applied to God because God performs miracles and wonders that cause reverential fear and constant amazement. For instance, it was awesome when God in creation just spoke and it was so. It was awesome when God took a hundred-year-old Abraham and a ninety-year-old Sarah, strengthened his loins, opened her womb, 
and gave them a child 25 years after the promise. Yes. It was awesome when God made the red, the red Sea stand up like a wall on each side so that his children could cross on dry land. It was awesome that when God's children were thirsty, God quenched their thirst with water from a dry rock. It was awesome when God took a man named Samson with the jawbone of a donkey and defeated a thousand Philistine warriors. It was awesome when God took a shepherd boy named David without the proper armor but armed him with a slingshot and a smooth stone and blessed him to knock a giant off of his feet. The word awesome has been appropriately applied to God because God performs miracles and wonders that cause reverential fear and constant amazement. Now as we look at our text here in Daniel chapter 3, once more and again the awesomeness of God is displayed as he delivers his children from a burning fiery furnace. Listen to the words of Nebuchadnezzar here in Daniel chapter 3 and beginning at verse number 28. Nebuchadnezzar himself says, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him. He's changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any other God except their own God. Notice here as Nebuchadnezzar has come to the conclusion that there is no God quite like the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He's literally awestruck at the ability that God has performed. He's looking at what God has done. He has watched God deliver his children from a situation from which he thought they would not be delivered and he has literally blown Nebuchadnezzar's mind. It's to such a degree that Nebuchadnezzar said in verse number 29, I need to make another decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made a dunghill, because when he looked at what God can do, and when he saw how God operated, he came to the conclusion that there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. Let me bag up just a little bit and share the story with you. It came to pass in the plain of Dura that Nebuchadnezzar here has erected a golden image. The height, according to verse number one, was three score cubits. That would literally be 90 feet. The breadth was six cubits, which would have been nine feet wide. We're looking at a statue of Nebuchadnezzar that's 90 feet tall and nine feet wide. Nebuchadnezzar sends out to gather all of the princes, the governors, and the captains, and the judges, and the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, all the rulers of the area provinces together so that they can come and celebrate with him at the dedication of this image that he has set up. At this point in Nebuchadnezzar's reign, he was the man. God has set him up on high. He was the most powerful man in the land. And Nebuchadnezzar is going to celebrate the fact that he is the most powerful man in the land. So he erects this image and invites everybody from the neighboring provinces to come and to celebrate with him on this occasion. Nebuchadnezzar sends forth a decree that at the time he plays his music, He's going to sound off a coronet, according to verse number five, a flute, a harp, a sack, but a soft strip, a dog sound, and other kinds of music. And when everybody hears the music, they were to fall down and worship the image 
that Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Well. And Nebuchadnezzar says, it's such a serious thing to me that whoever does not fall down, the same hour is going to be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. So the time came when Nebuchadnezzar played his music. All people, all languages, and all nationalities bowed down to the statue of Nebuchadnezzar except for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Well, some of the king's men came and thought that they needed to inform the king that there were certain individuals in his palace who were not obeying his commands. If we look at verse number 8, wherefore at that time the Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews and they spake and said to Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the coronet, the flute, the harp, the sad but soft and Alzheimer, and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whosoever falleth not down and worship, he shall be cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. They informed the king that there are certain Jews who you set over the province in battle, namely Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the image which thou hast set up. Nebuchadnezzar, in a rage and fury, calls for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to be brought before his presence. He had set them up over various affairs in the province of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar knew the character of these particular boys, and perhaps there was some kind of misunderstanding. Maybe they just didn't understand what he was requiring of them. So he summons for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to come before his presence. When these boys get before his presence, verse 14, Nebuchadnezzar speaks unto them and says, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, in my understanding, the report that's been given to me, is it true? What they're saying about you, that you don't worship my God, and you don't bow down to the image I have set up. Well, maybe that was some kind of misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. Y'all some good boys. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you another chance. I'm going to play my music again. And when you hear my music play, if you bow down and worship my image, all is forgiven. I'll overlook this minor discretion if you bow down when I play my music. Well, he says, but if not, you're going to be cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answer the king in verse number 16, they say, O king, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, the God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. These boys, being respectable boys, didn't get ugly with the king, did not buff up and try to make him see who they were or what they knew. All right. Respectably, they answered him as a, an authority figure and said, King, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. We understand that you made a decree. We need you to understand that we got a God that we serve who forbids us to bow down to your decree. So if it be so, our God whom we serve, we understand you got gods that you serve, but this ain't about the gods that you serve. At this point in our life, it's about the God that we serve. Right. And the God that we serve is able. Yes. And when you understand that God is able, yes. Yes. God will empower you to stand before anybody. Yes. When you understand that God is able, yes. it gives you a type 
of confidence that will not allow you to cower down to anything. When you know what you know, and when you know how you came to understand what you know, you know if you don't know anything else, you know that God is able. These boys tell him that God is able. And he will deliver us out of your hand. Well, the king, in his fury, according to verse 19, changes his facial expression against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They have shown up, made the king mad now, because he was about to give them another chance. They messed up the chance he was willing to give them. He commanded, according to verse number 20, the most mighty men in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego together and to cast them into the midst of this burning fiery furnace. The Bible says these men were bound in their coats and their hosen, and even in their hats and other garments. Nebuchadnezzar wanted to make sure that they were burned to a crisp as he cast them into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. The Bible informs us that because the king's commandment was urgent, and because the furnace was exceeding hot, that the flame of fire actually slew the men that took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego up to the fire. The fire was so hot that the mighty men that Nebuchadnezzar commanded to take them to the fire died themselves by trying to throw them into the fire. These boys fell down into the midst of the burning fiery furnace according to verse number 23. And that's when Nebuchadnezzar according to verse number 24 decided he would check on them to see how they were doing. As he looked over in the fire, the Bible tells us that Nebuchadnezzar needed some counseling. He brought forth his counselors and said, didn't we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said, true, old king. He answered and said, well, I, I don't see three, but I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire. And they have no hurt. And the form of the four is like the Son of God. That's when Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the furnace. Called and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Told them servants of the Most High God, come forth and come here. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, the princes, the governors, and the captains, and the king's counselors being gathered together were looking at them and expect, inspecting them. As they saw these men, they noticed their bodies were not fire, had no firepower on them. They noticed that there was neither a hair on their head that was singed. Their coats had not even changed colors. And they didn't even have the smell of fire on them. That's, right. That's when Nebuchadnezzar said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, yes. right. who have sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him. Mm -hmm. God has changed the king's word. Has yielded or spared their bodies. Mm -hmm. They might not worship nor serve any other God except their own God. Mm -hmm. In this, my brothers and sisters, we can see why Nebuchadnezzar came to the conclusion that God is an awesome God. First of all, because God changes consequences. The consequence for disobeying the king was death. But God changed that when he climbed into the fire with his children. Sometimes, my brothers and sisters, we learn from this account that God doesn't stop from happening what may prepare to happen. But God will get into the happening with you so that you can sustain yourself in the midst of what's happening. God did not stop them from being bound for the fire. God did not stop them from the men dressing them to be thrown into the fire. God did not stop them from being taken up to the fire. Nor stop them from being thrown into the midst of the fire. But what God 
it was got down into the fire with them yes. and protected them from what they were in. And I just thought I ought to share with you this morning that we serve a God yes. who might not stop you from encountering difficulty. Yes. He might not prevent bad and hard times from coming your way. Yes. But we serve a God yes. that will get yes. all yes. into the bad times with yes. you and protect you from what else is going on so that what's happening to you will not hurt you harm you or destroy you. Yes. He noticed that the God that they served had protected them in an environment. Yes. He thought they could not be protected. God may not stop it from happening, but God will walk with you through whatever's happening. Yes. David understood that in Psalms 23 and verse number 4 when he said, Yea, though I walk through the valley and the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. We need to live our lives in such a way that we know that God is with us. And if God is with us, there ain't much that can happen to us. For so long we've lived our lives in fear, wondering what may happen. But you have to wonder what may happen when you know that God is your God. When you know what you know and when you know that God is your God, it really doesn't matter what's happening because I serve a God that will get off into the happening with me and hold me and protect me and sustain me so that when I come out of what's happening, I don't even look like I ever been through what had happened. Oh, come on in the room here. We serve a God knows how to protect you from the elements. What's going on around you? The king said God had changed his word. His word. Everybody who would not buy would be cast to the midst of a burning pile in front. He literally meant death because of your disobedience. But God changed that because his children trusted in him. When you trust in God rather than anybody and anything else, God will protect you and change things in your favor. The Hebrew writer wrote in chapter 11 and verse number 6 that without faith yes. it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder. Watch this now. Of them that diligently seek him. Not only must you come to God, but while you're coming to God, you must believe that God is. Not only must you believe that God is, but you have to believe that God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That's another way of saying as long as I put God first, as long as I follow God's command, as long as my life reflects the fact that God is everything to me, when I come to God, I'm not worried about what's happening around me or even to me, but I believe that my God can deliver me. And when I believe that my God can deliver me, I'm not worried about what you're saying about me. When I know that my God can deliver me, your threats to me don't bother me because I am protected by a God who loves me. Believe that he is and that he is a reward. Yeah. Yeah. Seek him. Yeah. And 
when God is your God. All right. Doors that are shut All right. can be opened. All right. When God is your God, right. windows that are closed can be raised back up again. When God is your God, empty cabinets can be filled with food. When God is your God, lights that were cut off can be cut back home. When God is your God, repossessed automobiles can be returned to your driveway. When God is your God, a foreclosed house can be put back on the market. When God is your God, financial debts can be diminished. Bodily health can be restored. Sicknesses can be suffered. Cancers can be cured. Ailments can be alienated. Peace of mind can be pursued. Problems can be solved. Questions can be answered. Races can be run. And victories can be victoriously attained if you keep your hand in God's hand. God is an awesome God. Because God changes circumstances. But then God also changes the course of history. Nebuchadnezzar said as long as he's king, nobody better not ever say anything bad about the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Prior to this point, Nebuchadnezzar asked who is this God? Now that they have been properly introduced, never can never say, y'all better not say it in like a bad about this God. God changes the course of history. And when you look at your life, you ought to see the changes that God has made in your life. You ought not be the same as you were five years ago. You ought to be a different individual than you were ten years ago. God should have worked in your life to such a degree that folk who knew you way back then don't even recognize you now because God has changed your history. He's changed you from what you used to be to what you are. As you look at what God has done in your life, you can come Let's say, I am a but now child of God. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. I used to be a drunkard, but now I'm delivered. I used to be a fornicator, but now I'm faithful. I used to be a liar, but now a lover. I used to be merciless, but now I'm merciful. When I look at my life, I ought to see changes that God has made. God changes the course of history. Then the last reason why God is an awesome God. Because God creates possibilities out of impossibilities. There was no way in the world that Shadrach Meshach and Abednego was supposed to make it out alive out of that furnace. Mm -hmm. But God has the ability to make the impossible possible. Mm -hmm. When Jesus, Matthew chapter 19, was talking to his disciples about the fact that it was easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle mm -hmm. than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. He indicated that those who trust in riches not going to make it into the joys of our Lord. His disciples want to know who then can be saved. Jesus' reply was, with men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. God is able to make the impossible possible. When you trust and believe in him. When you look at David's life, he was standing before that Philistine warrior and champion Goliath. It looked like an impossible task 
that David was up against to beat somebody who had been fighting from their youth while David stood before him as just a youth. But David remembered in his life how that God had made the impossible possible. When they told Saul that there came a lion and a bear into my flock to grab one of my kids out of the flock. I took the lion by the, by the beard and slew him with my own hands. I slew the bear with my bare hands. And David said the same God that helped me kill the lion and the bear is the same God that's going to help me beat this uncircumcised Philistine. Yes. In other words, David was saying, I might not be able or possible to do it on my own. All right. I serve a God that's able to make the impossible possible. Yes. When you look at Daniel's situation, in Daniel chapter 6, when they threw Daniel into a lion's den, and thought that the lions would have eaten Daniel up overnight, yes. Yes. when Daniel came out the next morning, without even a tooth mark on it. It was a testimony to the fact that God was able to make the impossible possible. When you flip over to the New Testament and recognize in John chapter 11 that Jesus was sent word by Mary and Martha that his friend Lazarus was sick. When Jesus stays two days where he was and shows up four days later that at that time Lazarus is dead now. And Jesus indicates unto them that God is able to make the impossible possible if you just show me where you're laying. It was Lazarus' sister that said, well, Lord, by now he's stinking. That was our way of saying that there is just nothing for the Lord that you can do. If you had got here early enough, then you may have could have saved our brother from dying. As a matter of fact, that's exactly what they said. When they said, if you had have been here, then my brother wouldn't have died. They were saying that the time has passed for the possibility of us having our brother alive is gone now. And now the impossibility of rigor morris has set into his body. And by now decay has taken hold of his flesh. And he's by now he's probably stinking which means he's way past the hill point. In many of our lives, sometimes we think the same thing. We think that we've been dealing with something for so long that is, that is beyond repair. We think that we've been dealing with a situation that's dead. And because we couldn't revive it initially, that there's nothing that can happen that can help us now. They said, Lord, you should have came here earlier when he was just sick. And then maybe you could have prevented this from taking place because they didn't understand that God was able to make the impossible possible. And so what Jesus did was have them show him where he laid him, where they laid him. And when he got to the tomb, he discovered that there was a stone rolled up against the tomb. And that's when the Lord told them to roll away the stone. I, I sometimes marvel at the fact that if Jesus was getting ready to raise Lazarus from the dead, certainly all the Lord had to do was just say stone roll, and the stone would have rolled away from the tomb. But the fact is when you're dealing with God, that God wants you to do what you can do. At least if he was going to raise him from the dead, they could at least move the stone. And so if you're dealing with some stuff in your life that needs to be moved, make sure that you're doing what you can do. Make sure that if there's a stone blocking something, that you just straighten up your back and push with all of your might so that you can move that stone. The Lord is not going to move what you can move. And he ain't going to take care of what you can take care of yourself. So Jesus tells them to move the stone. Once they move the stone, then he was able to show them how that God was able to make the impossible possible by causing, by calling Lazarus from the grave. The Bible said that he came out bound in grave clothes. And that's when the Lord was able to speak to what had him bound by just saying loose him and let him go. There's some things that had you bound in 2014 that you need to be loose from this morning. There's some stuff that kept you tied up, tangled up, and wrapped up from last January all the way to last December. And it's a 
about time that you get free from it. There's some stuff that you grab on to that also grab the hope to you. And it's now time in this very first Sunday of 2015 for you to be loose and let go so that you can serve God the way you need to serve God. It's time out for those old excuses about this is what has always happened. And if this hadn't happened, then I wouldn't have done this, that, or the other. But I'm showing you through this account of God raising Lazarus from the dead is that God can make the impossible possible. And when God brings you out of something that you couldn't get out of yourself, then you got to determine that whatever was holding you back, you got to make it loose you and let you go so that you can be free from your past, right. free from your failures, yes. free from your hang-ups right. and your habits and your heartbreak so that God can do something with you that's going to be a blessing to somebody else. Yes. When God told the close to loose him and let him go, the Bible said they loosed him and by the time you flip over to chapter 12, you see a gathering coming together in the house of Lazarus with Lazarus being the guest of honor. What he was doing was blessing other folk with the fact that God can do what you can't do. Right. He was once dead, but a once dead man is now sitting down to dinner with folk who didn't die. And that's what people need to see in your life. They need to see that you were once dead in your sins, but when God raised you from the dead and saved your soul, when he put you in a new place with a new name, you're not the same as you used to be. It's up to you to bless somebody now. It's up to you to show them who you are and what you have become. God is an awesome God. And what better way to display that than to show for where you were and what you are right now. The only thing you need to be ashamed of is unchanged. Amen. 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 Doing the same old thing. Amen. The same old way. Well, when folk ask you, why you do it like that? Well, it's just what we've always done. Amen. That's the best answer you got? Amen. It didn't work then. All right. It ain't working now. All right. And it ain't gonna work tomorrow. <laughs> oh, come on in the room here. Right. The same thing? The same way? Getting the same results? And you think somehow things are going to just magically get better between you and your relationship with God? No, it's not. You, according to James chapter 4, have to draw nigh unto God. Y'all get that? You have to draw nigh unto God. You have to decide that you Want to change. Right. And that change has to involve you becoming closer to God. Yeah. Just say it, you want to be close to God. Right. Ain't going to put you no closer to God right. than where you are right now. Right. How many of y'all need resolutions? Well, well, well. What did you resolve <laughs> that you were going to do? with a new year that you didn't do all last year. Oh, I mean, what's the difference? Because it was a change of the year. I mean, it was a new day showing up. But God gave me 365 new days last year. And if I didn't do nothing with them, come in the room here. You think you're gonna make a difference but was that one day that happened in this year. What has to change is not the day. What has to change is your perception of the day. If this is the day that the Lord has made, and I have determined to rejoice and be glad in it, then I've got to make a change. If I've got some sour people accompanying me, they won't let the fruit of my rejoice smell up my atmosphere, then I need to change who's around me. Keeping negative company will cause you to be negative. Amen. Check yourself. Amen. Check yourself. Let's 
all I'm asking. Just check yourself. And see the, the faults of your heart. Mm -hmm. Become a little pessimistic. All right. Instead of seeing things working out, you're expecting for things mm -hmm. to go right. Mm -hmm. That's a result of negativity. Mm -hmm. There's a power in positive things. Mm -hmm. Philippians mm -hmm. chapter 4, yes, verse number 8. Yes, 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 Paul yes, tells yes. us whatsoever things are true, mm -hmm. good, mm -hmm. honest, yes. virtuous, if there be yes. any praise, yes. mm -hmm. think on mm -hmm. these yes. things. <laughs> when you receive the phone call from a certain somebody and you know they don't have anything good to say. The reason why you already know that before you answer the phone because they don't ever have anything positive or good to say. So what makes you think this occasion is any different from the previous occasions? Well, right. So when you know that they're calling you with these negative vibes and these negative words, just don't answer them. Yeah. And when you finally run into them and they say, you, know, you didn't return my call, let's have a look. <laughs> my God is an awesome God. I don't want to just say that. I want to live that. In order for me to properly live that, I have to surround myself with positivity. All 2014, you were clothed in negativity. You already know scripture? First Corinthians 15, 33. First Corinthians 13, 15, 33. E, be not deceived. Okay. Evil communication. Corrupts good man. So just tell them the truth. Unless you change, I have to change my dealings with you. I'm going to do better. Not I'm trying. There you go. Because folk will try for years. It amazes me. You still trying? I'm still trying. <laughs> And we become comfortable with trying. Because we'll say things like, well, at least I'm trying. <laughs> but look at how long you've been trying. Yeah, right, right, right. So don't stop trying and just do it. God's will, the message next Sunday evening at 5 is going to be, I can and I will. Right. Amen. 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 It's getting beyond that I'm trying Amen. syndrome Amen. that most of us have. I can and I will. If I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, then I can and I will. I ain't trying no more. I'm going to do it. I am doing it. Because I can do it. And if I can do it, why am I not doing it? Because I'm trying. That's why you ain't doing it, because it's trying. Quit trying and go and do it. You'll do it. I can do all things. If we can, then why aren't we? Right. Right. Did you get the message? God is awesome. When you know that God is awesome, you see things change. You're witnessing, even as you sit here in this auditorium, the awesomeness of God. There's a young lady back there who was our real estate agent two months ago. We met here one Friday night and looked at this building and said, Lord, we want it. Now, Lord, it's up to you for us to get it. We don't have the means. We don't have the history. We don't have any collateral. None of us got enough stocks and bonds. So, Lord, if you want us to have it, you're going to have to give it to us. And guess what, God? Because he wanted us to have it. That's right. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. Yes. And if you're here this morning and you believe that it's time to make changes in your life. If you need to repent of your sins, you can repent by confessing the fact that you have sinned. Changing in your mind what you need to walk away from so that you can be 
to God with even that. And if you confess the fact that you have sinned, according to 1 John 1, 9, our God is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. If you're here this morning and you're not a child of God, you can become one this morning by believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Mm -hmm. By repenting of your sins, Luke 13 and verse number 3. By confessing with your mouth, according to Romans 10, 9 and 10, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then you'll be baptized in water for the remission of your sins. There's no greater way to start off this year than to be a child of God. To put your hand in God's hand. And surrender your life to him. Yes. Complete surrender. Not, not any of this. I'll give it to him when it's convenient. And then when I want it back. I grab, no, no, no. <clears throat> you become dead to your old self. Right. In Christ. We're going to talk more about that this afternoon. Mm -hmm. You become dead. Mm -hmm. The old man dies. Yes. Right. And if he's dead, why are you still walking around with you? Amen. I've been here. That's right. That's right. Most folks are afraid of ghosts. <laughs> if it ain't, ain't gonna be walking around with you. <laughs> Do what needs to be done. All right. So that your new man, the one that's formed in the image of Christ, can stand out and people can see the difference and the change that God has made in your life. If you're subject to the Savior's invitation, we certainly want you to come down the aisle as we together stand and sing the song of invitation. Number 197.